Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm sure we'll have more people uh, joining us. Um, good afternoon, Newburgh teachers and administrators, and a special welcome to our friends attending from outside the district. I'm Pam Mears, the Literacy TOSA in Newburgh. And we're excited to welcome all of our attendees today. We wanna to thank our friends at Amplify, especially for giving us the opportunity to bring Natalie to us a second time. Um, thank you, Lynn and Daniel and Erin for all the work that goes on behind the scenes to get this ready. So uh, Natalie's pre uh, presentation today is going to be about 45 minutes. If you have questions during the presentation, uh, she says you're welcome to type them into the chat. And then she's graciously agreed to answer a few questions uh, at the end of her presentation. She also invites you to contact her through her website, which she generally shares at the end of her presentation. Okay. And um, we have enabled closed captions. So you're welcome to turn that on down at the bottom of your screen there. The session is being recorded. And you should receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording, as well as a link to fill out a request for one of Natalie's books. And now, uh, Karen Pugsley, Newberg's Director of Teaching and Learning will introduce Natalie. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Um, Ms. Wexler it has a BA from ha Harvard University, an MA in History from the University of Sussex, and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania. And she has worked as a reporter, a Supreme Court law clerk, a lawyer, and a legal historian. That's quite a resume. Um, and she has some great information today for us about the writing process and uh, the importance of writing. Um, during the session, Natalie will share why writing is the most popular lever we have for building the kind of knowledge needed to fuel reading and comprehension and academic success. In addition, she'll share why writing is the most difficult thing we ask students to do and offer two tips to make writing instruction in ELA classrooms more effective. Natalie's book, The Writing Revolution, will be available for those who attend. This is uh, uh, written for all grades and all subjects. Um, the Newburgh School District is proud to welcome Ms. Uh, Wexler to our district virtually, and we look forward to taking away powerful ideas and strategies that will support deep student learning in our classrooms. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Well, thank you, Karen, for that introduction, and i um, delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and hope that uh, I have better luck 
this time with getting the slides to advance than I had last time. So let me see what happens. Uh, all right, we will we will see what happens, but we'll plow on and in any event, uh, you'll be learning about all of these topics. Um, so uh, beyond the knowledge gap, and, and those of you who were here last time know something about the knowledge gap, um, cognitive load, writing, and literacy. So first of all, ah, they're advancing, very good. Uh, what is this term cognitive load or cognitive load theory? You may, like most teachers, you may not be familiar with it, uh, most educators, but um, here's a tweet. Oh, now it's not working. Oh, all right. I don't know what happened, but I'm going to have to just, I guess, do the, um, let's see. I don't know what's going on now. Um, okay. I'll just, I don't know why that uh, that is on there, but okay. <laughs> Can we, okay. All right. So I'll just do it this way. Um, so cognitive load theory. So this tweet you see on the screen um, is by from an e education expert named Dylan William. I've come to the conclusion, spoilers, cognitive load theory is the single most important thing for teachers to know. And I would bet a lot of teachers don't know what it is. So you may have certain questions in, in at your mind at the moment. Who's Dylan William? Well, he is a, he's mostly a, an expert on assessment, but he's a very knowledgeable British education expert. Uh, what is cognitive load theory, which I will go into in a minute? Why is it so important for teachers to know? And how does it relate to writing and literacy? So first, um, what is cognitive load? It's the burden that's placed on working memory. And as you may recall from last time, working memory is that aspect of our consciousness where we are taking in new information and trying to make sense of it. And the important thing to know about it is that it's very limited. It can only hold a few things for maybe 20 seconds, maybe five, seven items. And so if you're trying to juggle too much unfamiliar information, too much new information in working memory, it easily becomes overloaded. And you don't have the cognitive capacity to think about what you're trying to, trying to take in. It just gets forgotten. So, there are ways to get around those limitations though. And the most important way to get around the limitations of working memory is to have a lot of stuff in long-term memory that you can just draw on when you, like if you're reading about baseball and you know what a double play is, you don't have to think about what that is. You don't have to go look it up. You have additional capacity to just understand what you're reading about baseball and to retain that. So the trick is to transfer items from working memory to long-term memory, so they're stored there, and then to be able to retrieve them when you need them. Uh, and so the, a good way to transfer things from working memory to long-term memory is to attach meaning to them, maybe by explaining them to another person, either orally or in writing. And similarly with retrieval, um, practicing retrieval is what makes it easier to retrieve a story of information. So, Again, explaining it to another person in your own words is a great way to practice retrieval. I'd just like to quickly go over a few other things that flow from um, that may conflict with what you've heard about how people learn, because there's been this disconnect between what teachers get told and what scientists have found about how memory and learning works. So one thing is that having information in long-term memory is what enables students to think critically. So you can't just teach sort of critical thinking in the abstract because if, if you won't have the cognitive capacity to think critically about something you don't really know, the more information you have, the better able you are to think critically about it. So those things have to be combined. And secondly, quizzing information, students on information makes it easier to retrieve. That is a form of retrieval practice that can be very helpful. So quizzing students on factual information, names, dates, that's not a waste of time. That's actually laying the groundwork for higher order thinking. 
And then when students don't know much about a topic, explicit instruction or storytelling is gonna work better than inquiry or discovery, uh, which really places a heavy burden on working memory if kids are new to a topic. And then lastly, some difficulties are desirable. We don't wanna make things just really easy because there's no learning without effort. We just wanna get rid of the difficulties that are gonna interfere with learning rather than advance it. So that's just a quick tour through general cognitive load theory and some of the implications. But let's get back to literacy uh, and reading and writing. So how cognitive load relates to literacy. We've looked at literacy as being mostly or almost always reading, uh, but in fact, there are all these other things that, that make up literacy, listening, speaking, reading, writing. These are all components of literacy. And there are, an imp are important differences. Listening and speaking are what cognitive scientists call biologically primary. And that really means they're easier. You don't have to teach kids to do those things. Um, and they impose less of a cognitive load. Reading and writing, on the other hand, are harder. They do need to be taught explicitly. And they impose a much heavier burden on working memory. So the most efficient way to get information into kids' long-term memory initially and to have them practice retrieving it is through listening and speaking. And when that information is new, they're gonna have more cognitive capacity to absorb it because they don't have that heavy load that reading and writing imposes. But then once they've got that information there through listening and speaking, they can draw on it to do those more difficult tasks of reading and especially writing. So listening and speaking build the knowledge that fuels reading and writing if, and this is an important if, if all these activities focus on the same topic. So this isn't gonna happen, this, this synergy is not gonna happen if you've got say a separate writing curriculum and kids are, or kids are just writing about their personal experience. If, if it, to, to really take advantage of all of this, they should be listening, speaking, reading and writing all about the same topic. So let's talk more specifically about writing and, and the potential power of writing to build knowledge, to build literacy. Um, so first of all, writing can familiarize students with the conventions of written language, boosting reading comprehension. Written language is almost always more complex than spoken language, with subordinate clauses and all sorts of things. And reading aloud can help familiarize students with those peculiar things about written language, but even better is to teach students how to use those kinds of things in their own writing. And then they'll be in a much better position to understand those things when they come across them in their reading. Secondly, writing just forces kids to develop analytical abilities. For example, if you're constructing a paragraph and you are trying to write a topic sentence, you have got to decide what the main idea is, right? And what the supporting details are and all sorts of things. It just forces kids to make connections between different bits of information and figure out what's important, et cetera. And then building and deepening knowledge. So it's partly that they're having to analyze what they're writing about, but also that they are retrieving information they've slightly forgotten and putting it in their own words, very powerful way to get knowledge to stick. And that's, it's so powerful that it can even compensate for even large gaps in background knowledge, which can occur at upper grade levels if kids have not been exposed to a curriculum that builds knowledge all the way along through elementary school. So just briefly to show you how powerful writing can be, um, this was a study done 10 years ago um, in which college students were asked to read an article about sea otters. And uh, they were divided into four groups that used different methods of studying, you know, read it once, read it twice, do a concept map. And then there was this thing called retrieval practice, which was clearly more effective when students were tested on what they remembered a week later. And what this retrieval practice consisted of was having students write about the article that they had just read. So this is the potential. Um, so it's been said, not by me, I keep repeating this, but it's not original to me, that knowledge is like Velcro, it sticks best to other related knowledge, which is really another way of saying if you've got information in long-term memory, then you've got more 
relevant knowledge and long-term memory. You've got more capacity in working memory to take in new information. But another way, knowledge is like Velcro. And if you're missing half of that Velcro, writing can help supply the missing half. But most students are not getting these benefits. And unfortunately, they're not learning to write well either. So uh, I'm going to show you the most recent data we have on how well American students are writing. Uh, not well. Um, unfortunately, this is 10 years old. This is the most recent data, though, on the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, uh, the test given in writing. And as you can see, only about a quarter of all students tested uh, uh, scored at the proficient level or above, which is a lower proportion than score proficient or above on reading. That's about a third. And of course, by the same token, about three quarters of all students are scoring both basic or below basic. And for some student subgroups, that figure is much higher. So obviously, whatever we've been trying to do to teach writing has not been working. Um, and there are some things that our approaches to writing have been overlooking pretty consistently. So one thing the standard approaches overlook is that writing should be tied to the knowledge we want to build. Um, often there'll be a separate writing curriculum where, as I mentioned, kids are maybe, especially in elementary school, they will have been writing about their personal experience, personal narrative. Um, but even uh, when kids are writing more, you know, inform informational or persuasive uh, genres of writing, especially recently this has been happening, there's often like a separate writing curriculum or just these sort of random writing prompts that you know, are supposed to teach kids how to write persuasive essays, like convince your parents to raise your allowance, or things like that. Or in elementary school, it might be, should we have chocolate milk in the cafeteria? And the theory is, well, they'll just learn the general skill of persuasive writing and they'll be able to apply it in other contexts. And it doesn't really work like that. It's a lot easier to write something to convince your parents to raise your allowance. But also if we're not tying the writing to what students are learning as part of the core curriculum, we're not building the knowledge that we really want them to acquire use, using writing to do that. So if students are learning about the Civil War, that's what they should be writing about. Um, and one problem uh, is that especially at the elementary level, sometimes beyond, there's not very much content in the curriculum. There's not much focus on content. There's a lot of focus on these comprehension skills and strategies in the ELA block uh, where writing is taught. And um, it's, you know, you could be reading about zebras one day and clouds the next because the idea is what we're really teaching is identifying the main idea or pairing and contrasting. So it doesn't really matter what you're reading. But the result of this let alone the fact that that doesn't really teach kids how to understand what they read. Uh, kids don't have enough information often about any one topic to enable them to write much about it, even a few sentences. Um, so you've got to have content in the curriculum in order to use writing to build knowledge. But what if students arrive at upper grades without much academic knowledge, which is likely to happen these days because, oh, a lot of places have not been using a knowledge building curriculum beginning in kindergarten. But don't despair, all is not lost. Again, here's where writing instruction is potentially so powerful. It can help compensate for knowledge gaps if it's done in a way that modulates that heavy cognitive load that writing imposes. So remember our friend working memory is coming up here. Um, wait a second. Oops. lost my cursor. Oh, there it is. Sorry. So working memory again. What the standard approaches overlook, number two, writing is the hardest thing we ask students to do. So remember, working memory can hold only a few things for a limited period of time. Reading is, imposes a heavy burden on working memory, especially if kids are still learning to decode. But writing. Inexperienced writers may be juggling letter formation if they're young and they're still learning how to form letters, how to spell words, which of course in English is not an easy task, what words to use, 
how to organize their thoughts, the content they're writing about, figuring out like, what does that mean? Um, and then as I mentioned, there's that peculiar syntax and vocabulary of written language. And it can be hard to understand that when you encounter it in reading, but to create that is even harder. Um, and all of this creates cognitive load and also stress, because when you're asked to do something difficult, you get stressed. And stress creates an additional burden on working memory. So it's quite easy for kids to get, or inexperienced writers of any age, to get overwhelmed when they're asked to write. And teachers may not be aware of how difficult writing is for their students. Um, so they may give through no fault of their own, open-ended or complex writing prompts that really can be overwhelming. And these are a couple of examples taken really from second grade classrooms that did happen to be using a content-rich knowledge building curriculum. So the problem in this class, in these classrooms was not lack of content, lack of information, but to, you know, just this was really a hard task. So the one on the on the, and, and it's really not the teacher's fault. These were both amazing, wonderful teachers. They just hadn't been trained in teaching writing, like many teachers have not. Um, so the one on the left that just says slavery at the top of a blank page, that second grade teacher, um, these kids had been learning about the Civil War and she just handed them each this piece of paper and said, okay, now write down everything we, you can remember that we've learned about slavery over the past two or three days, which would have been a great prompt for oral discussion, but for writing, it was very hard for these kids to get started. They didn't know how to spell you know, Harriet Tubman. Or, um, so they, they were kind of paralyzed. The example on the right is from another, a different second grade classroom also that had been learning about the Civil War. I don't know how much you can see there, but um, it's, it's first, it's an exit ticket. And the teacher gave them a paragraph that's pretty dense about Abraham Lincoln and the Union Army um, trying to end the Civil War quickly. It's a pretty, even though these kids had been listening to a read aloud about this, it's, it's a pretty dense paragraph for second graders to get through. And these, most of these second graders came from non-English speaking families. And then they're supposed to, the question they're supposed to answer is quite open-ended. What did Lincoln and the Union soldiers plan to do to end the war quickly? Again, this could have been a great question for discussion, oral discussion, but it was very hard for the kids to answer that. Now, another possibility is to just do something like this where you've got a word bank and the kids just basically have to write the phrases from the word bank to answer the questions. And that is not a bad form of retrieval practice, not as powerful as, as putting information in your own words, but it does lighten cognitive load, but it's not really as powerful uh, as writing uh, to build knowledge and it doesn't teach kids how to write. So that's a problem. So. Um, we need to, if we really want to harness the power of writing, we need to observe two basic principles of writing instruction. First, embed writing activities in the content of the core curriculum, because that's the knowledge we want to build. And secondly, oh, I've, got a, I've got two number ones here, but this should be number two, modulate the cognitive load that writing is imposing so that students have the capacity to think about the content and also to learn how to write, to learn writing strategies. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about how we do that. Um, and this, obviously this is book, The Writing Revolution uh, sets out this method, which embodies these two principles. There may be other methods out there that embody both of these principles, but I have yet to find one. Um, and this is not my method. I'm just the co-author of this book. The method was developed by Judith Hockman, my co-author, a veteran educator over many years using trial and error, and actually starting with kids with language-based learning disabilities. But it turns out that this method really works for all students. So what does this method consist of? Well, first of all, um, deliberate practice. Deliberate practice helps embed writing skills in long-term memory. Now, deliberate practice is, again, a cognitive science term that could refer to any skill that you want to acquire, playing tennis, playing the piano, whatever. But the basic idea is you want to give students practice with manageable, manageable chunks of the process. So you got to break it down into manageable chunks. 
provide prompt targeted feedback. Um, so not, you know, a week later, uh, you hand back, you know, this needs to be clear, prompt targeted feedback. And then when students have grasped one chunk, you need to move on to another one that's harder. The teacher needs to decide, okay, what are we going to do next? And that's so that you have those desirable difficulties going on. You're not just having kids do something that's really easy for them, but you don't want it to be too overwhelming either. So what chunk of writing, of the writing process should we begin with? Sentences, and here's why. Sentences are the building work for writing. As Judy Hockman says, if you can't write a good sentence, you're unlikely to be able to write a good paragraph or a good essay. So start with sentences. But also sentences make it easier to teach grammar and conventions. Um, and there are studies showing that teaching rules of grammar and things like sentence diagramming in the abstract don't work. But that doesn't mean kids just pick grammar and conventions up naturally from reading or writing. Many, probably most, do not. And what they need is they do need to be taught grammar explicitly, but in the context of their own writing. And if you get five pages of error-filled writing back, it's going to be hard. You just Where do you begin? But if you're working at the sentence level, it's going to be much easier to home in on those mistakes, and, and it's also going to be less discouraging for students than if they get five pages of red ink back at them. And then lastly, and you know, most relevant to the tonight's topic, sentences free up space in working memory for those desirable difficulties. You know, writing is hard, writing at length is harder, um, but if, if you just have kids who are inexperienced writers working on sentences when they're acquiring some facility with writing, it's going to be less of an imposition on working memory. Um, so what are some possible sentence level skills that can be stored in long term memory through this kind of practice? Well, the most basic is the concept of a sentence. And I'll talk about that a bit later. But you know, this is not, a, this is not an easy concept, really. And a, a lot of older students and adults you know, it's, it's hard to figure out, well, what is a sentence and what's just a fragment or what's a run on? And there's a way to teach that, that goes beyond just providing a definition. And then different sentence types, you know, a statement, a question, we might tell kids to vary their sentence structure, but they might not know how to do that. So they need a, like a toolbox stored in long-term memory. Conjunctions like because, but, and so, even those simple conjunctions, a lot of students don't just pick up how to use them. And then more, more complex sentences, maybe using subordinating conjunctions and the positives, which I'll show you some examples of in a moment. And with, once these skills are in long-term memory, there's going to be more space in students' working memory to think about content and also to build their knowledge. So some sentence level activities are only really going to build those sentence construction skills. Uh, those are important. Um, and, and this actually, this thing called sentence combining, which is a way of uh, building those sentence construction skills, that's really what we've had the most research on in sentence level. And what that means is you give students three, maybe three uh, simple sentences like these, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa were twin cities, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa had urban planning, the cities had a system of plumbing, and then you ask them to combine those into one longer sentence, like, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa were twin cities that had urban planning and a system of plumbing. There are different ways to do that. And, and so this is a useful exercise up to a point, but it doesn't build kids' knowledge. It doesn't use writing to build kids' knowledge because it gives you all the information in those simple sentences. So even if you don't know anything about Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, you can write the possible combined sentence, but you're also, you're not retrieving information from long-term memory that you may have slightly forgotten and putting it in your own words. So it's not really going to be a powerful knowledge building activity. But some sentence level activities can simultaneously build knowledge and sentence construction skills. And this is an example. And by the way, this method is designed to be embedded in any subject matter at any grade level. Um, so let's say you're teaching kids about maps and you also want to teach them the difference between a sentence and a sentence fragment. You give them a bunch of unpunctuated groups of words and they have to decide 
which are the fragments and which is the sentence and put an F for a fragment S sentence. And then for the sentence, the complete sentence, they need to capitalize it and punctuate it, important things to know as well. But where the knowledge building comes in here is they have to add information to turn the fragments into complete sentences. So the first one is a picture of a part of earth. Well, what is a picture of a part of earth? Oh, a map. They have to retrieve that information and put that into a complete sentence that is appropriately punctuated and capitalized. So this is teaching, this really is building knowledge even though it seems like a pretty simple exercise. Another sentence level activity that can be very powerful is called because, but, and so. And that consists of giving students a sentence stem that they need to complete using those three different conjunctions. Um, so this could be here, the example is embedded in content about Abraham Lincoln. So the sentence stems could be Abraham Lincoln was a great president because, but, and so. And each of these asks for a different kind of information, but is gonna be more difficult because it asks for contrasting information. So is gonna be a cause and effect relationship, but it's different from the one in because. And each of these you know, kids are gonna be, again, retrieving that information and putting it in their own words. And there are, of course, different responses that they could provide, but here are some examples. Because he kept the North united during the Civil War, but many Americans didn't like him while he was alive. So more books have been written about him than any other American leader. So that's an example of this uh, approach embedded in social studies content. But as I said, it can be embedded in any content. For example, math. Suppose you're teaching about the difference between decimals and fractions. Um, you can use because, but, and so. Fractions are like decimals because. They are all parts of wholes, but they are written differently. So they can be used interchangeably. Um, now, a couple of things here. Obviously, with any of these activities, kids need to have a certain amount of information already about the topic or they won't be able to do these activities. Um, secondly, you know, math teacher might think, well, I'm not a writing teacher. Uh, you know, why should I do this? And they're, they are math teachers sometimes resistant to the idea of teaching using this uh, method, but when they try it, they discover that it's actually not interfering with their teaching of math concepts. It's really helping students get those concepts and think about them more deeply. So um, they often become quite enthusiastic about using this approach and kids, are, kids benefit from having this reinforced across the curriculum. Another example in science, um, they make good barriers. You, this is called sentence expansion, giving kids a very simple sentence, uh, which they then draw on knowledge that they have acquired in order to expand. And as guidance, these question words are provided. So obviously you, you, the kids are, know, what, you know what context this is in, so they'll put what, they'll put lipids where, around cells, why, nonpolar, and then they can combine all of that to create a, a more complex, expanded, information-packed sentence. Lipids make good barriers around cells because they are nonpolar. Going back to social studies, um, so I mentioned a positives, and a positive is a phrase describing a noun. And if you're studying, for example, ancient Greece, one way to teach kids about a positives and how to construct sentences with a positives is to give them an, a, an a positive, one or more positives. For example, a Greek city state. They then need to create a sentence around that a positive. So they have to think, well, what, what Greek city states do I know? Okay, Athens, a Greek city state. What about Athens? Okay, valued education and democracy. And that TS that you see before the sentence stands for topic sentence. So one of the things kids learn is that a sentence within a positive is a good type of sentence to use for a topic sentence of a paragraph. And, and this practice is then leading up to the point where they're going to be writing paragraphs. And a teacher could then say, well, try beginning it with an a positive, a sentence within a positive. Another sentence level strategy that is taught is how to use transition words to connect thoughts. But this, again, is also building knowledge. If you can see that, so this is embedded again in social studies content about the American Revolution. 
the instruction is to write follow-up sentences using the transition words. So the first one, the colonists were angry that they had to follow English laws and pay taxes to England. And then the word therefore is provided, but the student has to come up with the rest of that sentence. And that requires some mental effort and is building knowledge. Therefore, the colonists boycotted English goods. And then last example, a summary sentence. Um, so this is embedded actually in ELA content, the novel Johnny Tremaine. And so question words are provided to help a student come up with a sentence that's going to summarize this chapter or this part of this chapter. Who, what, when, where, and why. And those dotted lines are always for notes. The method also teaches kids how to write notes. Um, so they know if it's a dotted line, that's for notes. If it's a, if a solid line, that's for a complete sentence. And then the summary sentence, during the battle in Lexington, Johnny was scouting for Dr. Warren because he needed to give him some very important information about the British. One thing students are told is begin with the when during the, the battle. Why? Because that is a construction that is often found in written language, but not so often in spoken language. So this is helping them get accustomed to those peculiar, those uh, particular conventions of written language and use them in their own writing. And you know, some educators at higher grade levels may feel, well, writing sentences, that's really just for kids, it's, it's elementary level. But the rigor, as Judy Hockman says, was, is going to depend on the content. Sentence level work is not just for elementary students. So for example, this is a picture of an 18th century philosopher named Immanuel Kant. And I'm gonna offer you a sentence stem for you to try to complete. Immanuel Kant believed that space and time are subjective forms of human sensibility. But now I can't complete that sentence. You, you really need to know a lot about philosophy and Kant's philosophy uh, at the college or graduate level to be able to complete that sentence. So it, it's really not just for uh, elementary level students. And the method does not stop at the sentence level. Um, it, it goes through outlines, paragraphs, compositions, all the way through argumentative essays, which are the most, the most difficult genre of writing. Um, and But the sentences provide the foundation. But it's important to also pay attention to these other, you know, longer forms of writing, because even if you know how to compose a good complex sentence, and I know this myself as a professional writer, writing at length also imposes a lot of cognitive load. You know, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, what was I going to say next? Did I already say that? Um, and what you need, what is certainly an in it less experienced writer needs, and sometimes a more experienced writer, is an outline, uh, a roadmap that's going to offload some of that cognitive load so that you don't have to hold it all in working memory. You know, what was I gonna say next? You have an outline you can refer to. And the method does teach kids how to construct linear outlines, not bubble maps, which are just not, not enough of a, a roadmap. So here's an example of a single paragraph outline. Um, this, so on the outline, there's space for topic sentence. Is space exploration a good idea? So this is gonna be a persuasive or argumentative paragraph. And then there are these uh, dotted lines for notes that students can write down so they know where they're gonna go. And then they write down a concluding sentence using a subordinating conjunction, although that they've been explicitly taught how to use and they've practiced. Although space travel is expensive and dangerous, technological advances have proven extremely worthwhile. And once you've got that outline, it's a fairly simple matter to transfer it to a paragraph. And, and once you've got those sentence skills stored in long-term memory, you can use them to make that writing flow. So for example, the third sentence of this paragraph begins with the word, however, a transition word indicating a change of direction, which makes the thoughts connect, helps the thoughts connect. That again has been explicitly taught when and how to use that word, however. 
Um, and just briefly to give you some more examples, how to, how to construct a topic sentence, how to come up with that sort of general thought that's going to you know, hold all the details together is not something that necessarily comes intuitively, it needs to be taught. So kids get practice with generating topic sentences. They also can be given a topic sentence and then practice generating details. So this one's about spiders, spiders are interesting creatures. And if they need more help, teacher can provide these sort of these cues, babies, food, predators, danger, so that they have some guidelines for, for what the details are that they should include. And this is also a way to differentiate. You may have some kids who need those clues, but others don't. You may have some kids who can come up with their own topic sentence uh, and you just give them a blank outline and say, write a topic sentence about spiders. So it is quite possible to differentiate any of these activities for students at different levels of ability. The important thing is that they're all writing about the same content and using writing, therefore, to build knowledge of, of the same content and vocabulary. Um, so I'd like to just give you a brief example of what this method can accomplish with a student uh, who's exposed to it. I'm going to show you a writing sample of a ninth grader um, at a high school uh, that worked years ago with Judy Hockman. It was a very low performing high school in New York City that was actually in danger of being shut down because test scores and graduation rates were so low. But the administration and the teachers there decided to try what was then called the Hockman method. It wasn't yet called the writing revolution. Um, and brought in Judy Hockman to help them. And within three years, that school had gone from being in danger of being closed down to being uh, a success story that you know people from other schools came to observe what was going on in the school and to see how it had turned itself around. And the writing revolution was not the only thing that this school did, but it, they would tell you, I mean, I know teachers and the principal there, they would tell you they could not have done this without the writing revolution. Uh, so here's one student, Danny, at the beginning of ninth grade, and he was given this writing prompt just to get a sort of baseline writing sample, explain why we study the past. We study the past because it's good to learn about things that happened years ago. In history, we learn all about the past. We learn about wars that happened years ago, how many people died, generals, what countries were in them. Um, not a great piece of writing here. Um, and, and Danny was not in special ed. He was not an English language learner. He was just, he was in the general education uh, class. But after, it really later that same year, after being exposed to sentence level activities of the writing revolution, after being taught how to construct an outline, first of a paragraph, and then of an essay, uh, that spring Danny was able to produce this outline of an argumentative essay on the, the conquest of the Americas. He came up with a thesis statement, which he'd been taught explicitly how to construct. While some, uh, well, some view the conquest of the Americas as a positive event without question, it had a negative impact. So he knows where he's going. And then he's got an outline that includes details for his introduction, for his first paragraph on positive uh, factors, and then his second paragraph on negative, and then the conclusion. And then he's able to transfer that, drawing on his sentence skills to a finished essay. Throughout history, there have been many controversies. One such debate is over the Spanish conquest of the Americas, and there is his thesis statement. So he's obviously come a long way. Now, I can't guarantee that this will happen in every school that adopts this method. They had Judy Hockman right there helping them. But this is what's possible um, if it's implemented well and, and across the curriculum, at least to some extent. They actually started at New Dorp with social studies, but then it was in everything, including PE after a while. So just um, briefly to implement all of this effectively. And I would say, you know, um, it's, not a, it's not a curriculum that you can just take off the shelf. It, it does, it is a method that is designed to be adapted to whatever curriculum you're using. So it does take some 
work on the part of, of teachers um, and administrators. But those who, who have tried it have told me, you know, the first year it can be a little difficult, but after that, you know, it just, it becomes seamlessly interwoven with teaching and, uh, and very powerful. So I have made up this thing. This is me, not Judy Hoffman. The three I's. Um, the first I, introduce new writing strategies orally, collaboratively, and in a familiar context. And that's because we want to modulate cognitive load. So remember, doing things orally imposes less of a cognitive load collaboratively. And if it's in a familiar context, kids are not also juggling new information. So that, that could be something in the curriculum that they've learned about, or it could be, you know, holidays like uh, Halloween or something. Halloween, you know, if you're introducing me, I'd given a positive. Halloween, a popular holiday, et cetera. Second I, integrate writing activities with instruction. Do nows, review or basis of discuss for discussion, quick comprehension checks, exit tickets. I mean, obviously if you're doing a longer piece of writing, it's, you're gonna be spending more time on it. But the idea is here, not a separate writing block, a separate writing curriculum, but something that is just woven into instruction and uses writing in order to build knowledge as well as to teach writing skills. And lastly, interleave different strategies that have been covered. And that's a term, again, that's from, um, cognitive science, but it really means like just mix things up. If you taught a positives last month or three months ago, you think you might, you're done with the positives, but no, you should bring them back partly to remind students of that strategy because, you know, they'll retrieve it from long-term memory and then it will be easier for them to remember. But also because just because you did a positives with ancient Greece and now you're teaching, you know, I don't know, the civil war, um, it's going to be a different knowledge building exercise. They're going to be using it to build a different, different body of knowledge. So just to sum up, cognitive load, remember, is the burden placed on working memory when we try to take in new information. To free up space in working memory for comprehension and analysis, and learning to write, by the way, we need to modulate cognitive load. Listening and speaking impose less cognitive load than reading and especially writing. When students are still learning the mechanics of reading and writing, listening and speaking are therefore going to be the most efficient ways to get information into and out of long-term memory. Writing is potentially the most powerful way to get information to stick and build analytical ability if cognitive load is carefully modulated. And when all these aspects of literacy are connected and focused on rich content, the same rich content, students are able to reach their full potential. And um, I'm gonna take questions now, but if you don't get a chance to ask one tonight or you think of one later, you can always contact me through my website, nataliewexler.com, which I hope is pretty easy to remember. So I will stop sharing this screen and I would be happy to um, answer or try to answer whatever questions people might have. Um, I think Erin, have you been monitoring questions and maybe you can feed me some. Yes, absolutely. Hi, everybody. I'm just, um, mine actually less of a question, but just more of a comment that um, listening to you speak about even sentence level construction really helps to, uh, confirm and gel for me that it is so difficult you might have a lot of information swirling in your mind you might feel like you know a lot about a topic but when asked to actually put it down on paper it really does require you to um, think more deeply about it and make more sense of that content which i hadn't really put those things together before this yeah. evening yeah and i would just add that something like because that because but and so activity and be more powerful than just asking kids, why was Abraham Lincoln a great president? Because it really, it focuses their attention on what you really want them to get at, uh, in addition to teaching them how to use conjunctions. So it sort of gives them these sort of guardrails uh, and, and that, that makes it more powerful than just asking more of an open-ended question. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have a couple of other questions. So. Um, so you've been sharing this information and in your um, in your experience in working with secondary teachers, what is their initial response to this kind of approach and um, how do you feel that they do they do they kind of 
well, what is their response in your experience? And then what, what happens next? Well, I actually clarify that I don't know who's on, you know, training them in this method. If any revolution organization does that, they, they offer online courses as a supplement to that book. The book, you know, is intended to be a guide to implementing the method, but it, ideally, I think for many teachers, uh, taking the course is going to be really, really helpful. And the organization also partners with schools around the country in helping them more intensively in a more hands-on way implement the method. I'm not affiliated with the Writing Revolution organization, but I do know people there and I'm on the advisory board. And I mean, you know, I think initially, and this may be changing, they actually were in more secondary schools than elementary schools um, because it, they, they're based in New York City. And in New York City, a lot of elementary schools are not really teaching much content and they're, they're very into Lucy Calkins and Writer's Workshop, which is different, a different approach. So the secondary teachers though, they, they saw that their students, as in at this high school in New Dorp on, uh, that, that turned itself around with the help of the writing revolution, their students could not write and they were desperate to, they, in many cases, desperate to figure out a way to help them write. And I mean, I think there's sometimes some resistance, like, you know, these are 10th graders, they're supposed to be writing essays, and you're asking me to just have them write sentences. But, um, you know, I, I don't think, for the most part, I, I don't think there's been a lot of that resistance. I think there's been, um, you know, pretty quickly teachers see the power of this method and they see their students' writing improve. And even if, as a new dorp, it starts with just the social studies department, you know, it word kind of, kind of spreads and the Spanish teacher wants to try it and, you know, the science teacher wants to try it. And so I think that's ideal if it spreads more organically like that rather than just, you know, saying, okay, everybody has to do this now. So I think the best way to start is with, you know, a coalition of the world people who really want to do it and are prepared to, um, to try to make it really work. And, uh, and then others, you know, are, want to know what's going on and maybe want to try it themselves. Absolutely. And I'm just going to, um, again, not a question, but a comment from Beth, um, which I agree with. This seems what, what she's loving about this is it seems like it's not an additional writing curriculum per se, but it's a way and a method for all teachers across the school to integrate writing into their daily instruction and how they have students respond to the learning that they're doing in the classroom. So um, I think I saw that comment a few times that it really does seem like this is great because it's not like an extra thing to add on, but rather just a strategy that any teacher could apply in their classroom. That's, that's right. And ideally, teachers will be, you know, we'll have some common planning time so that they'll be using a common vocabulary and maybe they'll be working on the positives, you know, in science and in social studies and maybe in ELA math, you know, so that the kids are getting that reinforcement. But it's, it is definitely not a curriculum with its own content. That's right. Excellent. Yes. And Lynn just added in too that that's for any teacher at any level, right? So it's not just um, K-5 or 6-8 or 9-12. It really can be applied um, and scaffolded at any grade level. Yeah. Cool. And um, actually, it also works very well with English language learners. Um, and there are uh, ways to modulate cognitive load so that if, you know, it can either be for kids in kindergarten through second grade who are still learning like the mechanics of writing and spelling that you could, for example, um, give them pre-printed sentence strips, which they can use, you know, to learn even something like subordinating conjunctions, um, they, as long as they can read, but they're not having to do the work of spelling and writing. They, they can manipulate something that's already printed in a way that really helps them understand how to construct complex sentences and also builds their knowledge of whatever the content is. This will probably sound silly, but what I really love about the um, bringing in the grammar piece is that it's not grammar for the sake of grammar. Like again, another aha I had while you were talking is that the because, but, so, 
really calls on your ability to know the content that you like, what content do you know about Abraham Lincoln and be able to match it appropriately so that you're, you're using that grammatical structure in the context of content that, you know, right. It's not, they're not isolated. Yes. Right. Well, this is right. That this is the way the, the most effective way to teach grammar is through students own writing. And so there are some grammatical terms that are introduced, but not for the sake of kids knowing, for example, like what a prepositional phrase is, that term is not used. The terms that are used, like a positive, they're used in order to give teachers and students a shorthand for like talking about, like if the teacher says, you know, is trying to make a suggestion for varying sentence structure or for constructing a topic sentence, it's, it's, it's helpful to be able to say, well, why don't you try using an appositive and having the student understand what that means. So there, those terms that are focused on are very carefully chosen for that reason. Wonderful. Okay. Well, we'll just give it a second and see if anybody has any last questions or comments. Um, and as we're waiting, I'll just mention something I put in the chat, but to everybody um, that you will be getting an email tomorrow. And in that email, there'll be a recording of this session. Um, also, there will be a link to go to a website and select your book of choice. So we're offering for those that attended the session, you can choose between the knowledge gap, um, which was mentioned at the beginning, the introduction of our session, but also, uh, Karen mentioned that, but also the writing revolution, which Natalie was sharing throughout the session and gave her examples from, that's also a choice that you have. So if you'd like either copies of those books, just fill out that form and then we'll pop those in the mail to you. I, I think it's time to say thank you to all the folks that participated this uh, this evening, and especially Natalie. Thank you so much for um, the presentation. It was really um, thoughtful, and it was also really useful. I think, um, and as an old writing teacher, uh, not necessarily age, but just a long time since I've been a writing teacher, um, I really appreciate the shorthand approach, which is an awesome way for us to actually support students to string their thoughts together in a way that's going to be effective. So um, lots of, of thinking right now in my mind about how to do that in a district-wide way. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you to the Amplify team for hosting this um, and Pam Mears for um, helping uh, to set this up. Um, our commitment in this district to improve our literacy for our students is really based on the idea that um, literacy is liberation and um, it is probably the most important equity action we can take as um, educators. So this really helps us do that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks everyone. You're welcome. Thank you.